Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chuck Dunphy from the team here, Turn the Ship Around. Uh, we'll start in a couple moments. People are still, we're still admitting people into the conversation uh, and we'll give them another minute. Um, it would be most everybody, I see everybody here is muted, but yeah, if everybody could have their cameras on if possible, that always, we always like to see everybody. It makes it a little easier to, to have a conversation. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. You can just do something briefly, uh, brief there, and then I'll actually call on, uh, I'll, I'll call on you, uh, and then you can ask your question directly. And if there's follow-up to that or there needs to be clarity, you'll be able to, to interact and, and be part of that conversation. And then I'll go to the next one. Um, we do... Uh, we, we try to respect everybody's time and we generally, we keep these to 30 minutes. Um, so if we don't get to your question, uh, please make sure you have it. We can, you can type it into the chat box and we will answer uh, at least some of those uh, in our social media, or you could just ask it either on the YouTube page or in our, one of our other social media platforms, and we will look to get to it. Um, Oh, thanks, Bill. Hope everything's going well in Cincinnati. Um, and then, yeah, another fun thing, if everybody wanted to uh, type in where they were, where they are right now, um, that's always fun to do. So um, I guess without further ado, you know, let's start the conversation with, uh, with David. Hey, guys. Hey, welcome. And thanks, everyone, for joining me. So uh, normal format. Format is a 10, 10, 10 format. I'll spend about 10 minutes talking about today's nudge, which is actually a sequence of six nudges. Then we'll do 10 minutes of interaction, where, which will be focused on the nudge. And then the last 10 minutes, we'll kind of open it up and do whatever you guys, uh, whatever's on your mind, talk about whatever's on your mind. So uh, the idea here is during the Cold War, I spent 87 days underwater. That was my longest stretch. Now, yeah, Chuck was with me on the Santa Fe. He's also spent time underwater. Andy spent time underwater. Uh, and all submariners do. And so it's a weird combination of isolation because you're away from your families and you're away from sunlight. But you also have this close proximity of individuals and it feels like they're in your space. And we dealt with it some... some <laughs> some better than others, but what I've done is categorize what I think the practices were that allowed us to come out of those periods still feeling strong, safe, and ha having a good sense of, of team. So that's basically what I want to talk about in, in this nudge. So the first, and, and they're all start with the letter R. So apparently I have a an affiliation for alliteration, and, and this is one of them. So the first one I wanna call is routine. And the, the idea behind routine is that you structure the part of your day that you can control. When things feel out of control, like COVID-19 or whatever's happening, your, your brain starts to go haywire and you start to send signals of anxiety and uncertainty and as a leader, this generally is not good for your team. What you want to do is send a signal of calm, quiet confidence. Not overconfidence, but just confidence. Hey, we're going to get through this. And one of the ways you do that is you train your body to believe that you're still in control of as much as you can be in control of. So for me, I focus on the very beginning of the day and the end of the day. And I have a wake up routine which includes doing some different things, a crossword puzzle, a yoga, a yoga, and I kind of sequence through that. And I don't even look at my phone and get captured by email and news until I've got through that sequence. Sometimes this annoys my wife because I'm a little bit um, overzealous about going <laughs> through the sequence, but it lets me feel really controlled. And, th and then the end of the day, and if there's one thing that is really important to control, it's your bedtime. There was a recent study that showed even delaying your bedtime by 30 minutes results in a slightly higher resting heart rate over the next couple of days, which then makes you more susceptible to various cardiovascular diseases. 
and it's a sign of, of less health. So controlling your bed, if you don't control your bedtime, what happens is you don't get the right amount of sleep, your alarm goes off, and you're already out of control because you're hitting snooze a bunch of times and then you drag yourself out of bed. So for me, being in control starts with controlling your bedtime. And what happens is then with, with repetition, it sends a signal to your body, you got this, and then you can present a calm, quiet, confident demeanor to your team. Calm is contagious and they are feeling anxiety and it's your job to calm things out. So calm is contagious. So number one is routine. So each person is just gonna be individual, but if you wanna start with one thing, I'd start with bedtime. Number two is ritual. Now on the submarine, we'd be out over major holidays, we'd be out over people's birthdays, and we always did the best we could to replicate the holiday. Now, Chuck was the supply officer, and so if we were gonna be out over Thanksgiving, he'd order some frozen turkeys and we would have Thanksgiving. We'd also prob probably we'd have dehydrated peas and those flaky potatoes that came in a box. So it wasn't exactly like the Thanksgiving you had at home, but we would certainly make our effort and we would decorate the, sub the cruise mess and the, and the wardroom where we ate with Thanksgiving themes. And we think about our families. And the, and the sense of ritual, I think was also very important that kept us grounded in the rhythms of the year and the rhythms of life and, and this idea that things are gonna are, are keep continuing and that it's not as an abrupt a break from the past as it might seem. Oh, everything's different, everything's up in the air. Yeah, a lot of it is up in the air, but there's a lot that we can continue and carry forward. And again, this helps you feel calm and in control and confident, and then exude that, express that to your team. Number three is what I call red work. And this comes, this, the term red work refers to the, the physical action of the work. And we separate work into two categories, blue work, which tends to be contemplative, reflective thinking work, and red work, which is the if, if it's coding, it's writing, it's flying the airplane, it's conducting the, um, doing the medical procedure, it's the actual work. And we would immerse ourselves in the work. And when you're in the work, you tend to be focused at the exclusion of distractions. And you're not at that moment worrying about COVID-19 and those kind of things. So immersion in the work is really important. The problem is we tend to get stuck in the blue work, which is the contemplative of what should we do, what decisions should we make, how should we respond, what new products should we do. And spending too much time in that contemplation is a prescription for uh, depression because there's no action. Action is the antidote to depression. So you wanna spend just enough time to come up with a hypothesis, well, if we try this, like this is an example, these live Zoom calls are, we don't know how they're gonna go. People love them, hate them, interested, worth it, not. So, hey, let's just do a bunch and see how kind of feedback we get. So, but then we're doing them. It's launching into the red work. So if you feel yourself in your head a lot, you might wanna go, okay, what can I do now, easy and fast, and launch yourself into that aspect of the work. Next is what I'm gonna call replenish. Replenish is the idea you gotta take care of your physical self. So this is getting the right amount of sleep, which we talked about, doing exercise at home, getting the sunlight, going out for a walk if you can, getting some sunlight. And I'm gonna show you, I'm actually in my own gym here I live in Florida, so housing isn't that expensive. It's not like New York City apartments. So I haven't a nice, I, I just by luck converted my garage into a gym just before this thing happened. So I'm in my gym here and my Peloton bike over here. And I'm finding I'm able to spend a bunch of time here uh, in the gym. By the way, if you want one piece of exercise equipment, just one, I recommend this. This is called a Bozu ball, and you can do everything on it, including uh, you can do cardio, you can do strength, you can do flexibility, you can do core. 
You can do, uh, but you can also do balance, which you can't do uh, on almost any other piece of exercise equipment. And as, as I get older, that, that balance is, is a really important thing not to uh, forget about. But the point is, to get, you want to you want to take care of yourself in whatever way that you do that. Number five is retreat. On the submarine, we did not have a lot of personal space. We had a bunk that was about six feet long, twenty four inches wide, and about eighteen inches high. Well, until I got until I was captain. <laughs> But everyone else, including like the XO, the second in command, you have this little bunk. And, but key thing, the bunk had a curtain on it. So when you pulled that curtain, that was your little private space. It wasn't a lot, but it was your private space. And only in the most dire emergencies would we pull the curtain back and, and uh, tell a sailor uh, or a chief or, or an officer, hey, we need, we need you to come deal with some issue. And so, Give yourself permission to pull the curtain back, to, 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 to shut the curtain. Give yourself permission to say to your family or your coworkers, whatever it happens to be, hey, I need this time for me and do that. And one of the things we talked about recently was a 100-0 rule. So it's okay to, if you can't spend 100% 100 of your focus and energy on somebody or something, spend zero. And it's the spending 100% that allows you to spend, to get away with saying, Hey, I can't right now. I'm just, I need to sh shut down and reboot. And then finally, it's respect. Part of this is respecting others. And so if you bump into them and say, hey, bleh, what, what was that? Just say, yeah, I'm sorry. And we would bump into each other in the submarine. And I would always know as the captain, if, if the crew needed a break, because I'd be walking around the ship and in different places, I'd hear people start to snipe at each other. And that was a sign of fatigue. And we'd bring the ship away from whatever we were doing and tell everyone to chill out and for 24 hours. But here's the key. It's respect and assume respect, which means that if someone else slights you, they're sharp with you in a meeting, they take the last cup of coffee and they don't refill it. Driver cuts you off. And just assume they respect you and that this is just a behavior that's a result of them feeling under stress because of the environment that they're in, which for us was the unnatural environment of spending day after day after day separated from your families and then this little metal tube driving around under the ocean. And now it could be day after day spending at home not as much interaction, spend all day on Zoom calls, whatever it happens to be. The key is assume respect. Don't go down the path of, well, you dissed me, blah, blah, blah. That's not gonna get, that's not gonna get us too far. So that's the, um, that's the idea. This is the link to the, to the nudge. And so there's six separate nudges. Each one's about a minute or so long. And that is it for those. Let me go back to the six. So here are the six. So what I'd like to do now is open it up and see what you guys got in chat, what's on your mind. And so for the next uh, third of this, I like to stay focused on the nudge and then we'll kind of open it up wide open at the end. Can you assume respect it a bit more? What does it mean? Um, I wish I had a better formula for it, but the idea is so, sometimes when it's not a stressful situation, we just say assume good intent. Assume that the other person is, it's the prism through which you view their behaviors. So if someone does, someone does something, assume good intent. For example, you're on the Metro, and there's a mom and a kid and the kid is acting up and the mom's sort of not paying attention to the kid. And your instinct is, well, you know, people need to pay more attention to their kids and acting up on the subway is disruptive to the other passengers. Well, maybe this person is coming back from a funeral or who knows what's going on in, in, in their life. Maybe they just got laid off. Maybe they just picked their kid up at school 
I don't know. Uh, so the idea, so if I look at it from the prism of what's wrong with them, then I'm going to find something wrong. But if I look at it through the prism of they're, they're a human being trying to deal with the same life stresses that all the rest of us are trying to deal with and probably didn't get on the metro today with the express purpose of pissing me off, then it's probably going to be easier <laughs> for me to deal with it. And um, back in the good old days when I used to travel around the planet on airplanes, <laughs> I saw a lot of what I, what I thought was bad behavior. And I know you guys have all seen the same idea. But it's just, uh, yeah, someone's typing in uh, unconditional positive regard. Yeah, I love that. Um, again, I, as you guys know, I stumble on these things accidentally. They were just things that worked for us on the submarine. And I, I, I always encourage when I, someone helps me out and says, well, there's actually science, um, science behind it. Uh, okay, how can I, I'm just sort of randomly, how can I encourage my team to follow the six hours of sound like, sounding like a babysitter? So uh, here, here's how I think about that. I, I, I would love for you guys to do this. I think your life will be better if, if you can do some of these, especially the ones that, that seem to appeal to you, but we're all different. Some people have, have more more natural towards chaos. I tend to be more of a, um, a OCD kind of personality where control and rigor is, is important to me. And I think that would played a part in my journey as a, as a leader. I, I, number one, we, we always say, look, model the behavior and then invite. I'm a huge fan of the word invite, whether it's inviting people up the ladder of leadership, inviting them to do a certain behavior. Because at the end of the day, you can't really control that. And yeah, I. I see people every day where like that decision that you just made, you're making your life worse. It's obvious for me to see what, how you're doing, especially um, with young people. But I would say model the behavior and, and it's always a choice. So you can say, look here, I've been practicing this. Don't, don't tell anyone to do anything or don't, don't even talk to them about it for a week. You practice it for a week. See how you feel and then share the story. Hey, I saw, I tried, Mark K gave these six things. I only tried two of them, this one and this one, because they kind of seem to fit in my life. And now I'm feeling quieter, calmer, more in control. And it's, this is, by the way, it's like a diet. Uh, you get on the scale tomorrow, the weight, your weight's not going to change. It's, it, it's repetitive over time. It's got to get into your brain and, you're, and, you're, and your brain's got to grow in a way that so it's adapting to what's, what's going on. But it's always a choice and it's respecting them. Say, hey, I think... If you, if you try some of this, you'll have a better life, but the choice is, <laughs> the choice is always up to you. And I'm scrolling Scrum, retrospectives, you see, use the Scrum retrospective to see how well you've done with the six R's. Steve, tell me, are you, are you talking about using six R's in Scrum retrospective? Well, just tell me more well, what you mean. By that. The, the first part of it kind of scrolled off. The first part is with Scrum, you come to an agreement with your team up front. And that could be at the beginning of the project. It could be at the beginning of a sprint, however you want to do it. But you come to an agreement. And so one of the things you could introduce is the six hours as a concept. Then as you go through your sprint, um, you know, you have your behaviors, you have your, your daily um, rituals to go through. But then at the end of the sprint, you have your retrospective. And one of the things you can do is, is look back at, hey, at the beginning, we had these agreements. How well did we do on our agreements? And, and that's one way to do it. We know up front what we're doing, and then we can reflect on how well we did it. So we're not being a babysitter. We're, we're you know, managing it as a team. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a, our word. So that maybe you should, like, that wraps the whole thing. That's like spinning the wheel. The whole, yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, uh, I hear Karina saying, if you're tired of saying it, they're just beginning to hear it. I really love that. I, I always, I have a picture. I don't have it readily available, but I had a picture on the submarine of my dog. It was a nine frame picture and the dog was standing. This is our, uh, our dog Barclay. And uh, I was standing, the dog was standing and, I, and it says sit. So sit, 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 
it's, it's, it's an eight frames, it says sit, nothing changes in the last frame the dog is sitting. And it's, it, says, it says good dog. And because I was walking around the ship one day, and this was about a year into it, and we've been, there were a couple of things we've been talking about. First of all, no bay on Santa Fe. You have to use the word we. And number two was for people in qualifications, I had a special uh, waiver authority as a commanding officer. So the Navy regulations would say, if you want to be a diving officer, which would be the person responsible for controlling the ship's depth and angle like that, you need to know these skills, demonstrate these, uh, demonstrate these practical skills, know this information, and have 10 years in the Navy. <laughs> and I was like, what does 10 years in the Navy have to do with anything? I mean, I think it was a proxy for maturity or something like that. But we always said on Santa Fe, look, if, if you have the skills and you have the ability, we're going to qualify you because I didn't want people to have an external excuse for why they weren't self-improving. So in other words, everything about self-improvement and obtaining greater levels of responsibility was within your control. And I talked about this until I was, quote, blue in the face. And about a year into it, I rounded the corner. Andy, maybe these were a couple sonar men. I don't know, but no, probably not. But uh, around the corner, and there were two crewmen that were talking. I just kind of caught the last bit of, bit of the conversation. And one of the crewmen says to the other, oh, they'll not, they'll, they won't let you qualify because you're not, you don't have enough time in the Navy. And this just, like, made me so angry because these were two things. They, and he, they were, and he was repeating this this toxic approach from the previous commander. Okay, okay, yeah, the rest, whole rest of the Navy had this approach, but it was not, I thought, helpful. And so, of course, I wanted to explode, but I went back, I put my head like this, and so that's when I made this poster, because for me, it felt like I was saying things over and 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 over, and over again, but we were always getting new people on the ship, and just because I was saying it in the control room where there were eight people it doesn't mean 140 people per, heard what I was. It's supposed to feel repetitive. That was the lesson that I had there. Uh, any other questions? Feel free. Sorry, Chuck, are you talking? I was. I was just asking if anybody else had any questions. We, we you know, lots of people commenting. Um, Good. Oh, feedback. Oh, yeah. So here's, okay, so we're past 320. So now we're in the last third. So we opened up to anything. So someone said, uh, or, or here's the comment, or the, the comments about my Twitter thing. Hey, I commented that giving, creating cultures where we give feedback gives people permission to be jerks. And uh, the reason I said that was because I was pissed off because I saw a company that was claiming to be one where they're all about giving feedback. Now, what we say, as you probably know, is it's not about giving feedback, it's about inviting feedback. Hey, how'd I do? Hey, check my thinking. And that the whole mechanism of intent, one of the powers of it is because you're saying, this is what I intend to do before you actually do it, you're inviting feedback before the event as, a as opposed to doing something and then we all run out and say, why did you just do that? Now it's feedback, which feels nasty versus let's talk about it before we actually do the thing. So the, even the, the idea, hey, I intend to launch the product. I intend to not launch the product, whatever it happens to be. So it's about inviting feedback. So with this company and they're very proud of this how they've developed this idea of giving feedback. But what I observed was they just, they would just kind of walk around and just dump on each other. And if you didn't take it well, then they would dump on you for not taking feedback well. And it really <laughs> seemed kind of toxic to me. And I know that if I were in that company, I wouldn't have liked it. I wouldn't have liked it. And, and, and I think that what they were just doing, kind of what they ended up doing was the feedback was just permission to be a jerk. Here's the problem. If 
leadership is love. If, if you know I love you and I want you to have a better life, then when your boss comes to you and says, hey, David, uh, it didn't go so well. <laughs> what are you thinking? Um, it doesn't sting because you know their heart is on your side when in, in environments where sort of it's every person for themselves, then it doesn't really matter how much dressing up we do of the quote feedback because I don't want to hear it anyway because it's just you being mean to me. And that was my experience. I know there's some huge advocates of these feedback cultures. Ray Dalio talks about it in his book, Principles. It's just, I've seen it kind of go off the rails and maybe it was because feedback without empathy is just being a jerk. Feedback with empathy maybe is path to improvement, something like that. Okay. There's a few comments there. Um, Jonathan, you were, you definitely uh, experienced this one. Um, Patrick, Patrick Hill, you want to ask your question there? Pat Hill, Navy band. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. I, with, with regard to that feedback, do you think that it helps, uh, if you have something to, to, um, to, to tell someone how they can improve, do you think it helps to open it up by saying, how do you feel it went? How do you feel your performance is going? Um, and give them an opportunity to self-assess and then either you can add on to it or you can maybe say, okay, well, this is what I see from my perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if reflection, like the scrum process, if it is a regular part of it, then yeah, that's fine. But if your boss kind of calls you up and says, well, how do you think that went, Pat? You're like, oh, crap. So you're already kind of sending a signal that things didn't go so well. Look, here's the deal. You know it didn't go well. And the other thing is, um, on the Santa Fe, what I experienced was people would come to come into my stateroom and they'd be like, oh, I screwed it up. Like, I didn't need to give them, they, they already knew it didn't go well. And they were already doing things to, to make it go better. Now, there's there's a difference between feedback and training, I, I guess. And I don't know, I may sound hypocritical here, but we did spend a lot of time, I spent a lot of time looking at how people said, well, show me, how, how did you analyze that? What was the graph you looked at? What, what was, not, not only what was the data, but how was the data presented? Was it a graph? Was it a chart? Was it a histogram? And we spent a lot of time talking about that. And I was a big fan. Uh, another thing um, is there's a guy named Edward Tuft, T-U-F-T-E, genius stuff on the quantitative, uh, the, the visual display of quantitative information. And everything we did on a submarine had quantitative information. And all of our charts and graphs were world, designed in either World War II or on, uh, what was that? It was even before Excel, like one, two, Lotus one, two, Lotus one, two, three. They were very basic and they weren't human design graphics. And so uh, I, I did spend a lot of time on that and, and I would just tell them, hey, try doing the graph this way or do the graph. I just say, just do the, do the graph this way. But I always tried, to, so in other words, I would get involved in the process, but I was trying to release control of the decision. So if you do the graph this way, the information will present itself to you in a way that your decision will naturally be better. And, the, and what I kept trying to do was build a decision-making factory, not build a, a system where everything channeled to me and then I got to be the big guy making all the decisions. Yeah, I, and I think I see something, Scott. Yeah, hey, Scott. Um, Scott, I hope your team's doing well. Uh, ground rules and core. Yeah, I, I think you got to be really clear about how your what your company 
or organizations beliefs are because then you'll attract people who are, should be naturally attracted to those beliefs the problem is when we say oh we're an engineering company but it's really a personality driven company or we're an engineering company that's really a marketing company am i thinking about Boeing? yeah maybe um and that's when you get in trouble because you'll attract engineers but then they'll realize it's really not an engineering company and then then you have problems. All right, I think we got one last question uh, from Chris Chinchilla. Chris, thanks for coming again, by the way. Oh, no problem with questions or uh, with performance and expecting something to get done. I try to give information, you know, that uh, I need that report today and I try to avoid instruction like, hey, you need to submit that report right now. How can we deal with that with uh, teammates and team members? I, well, that's a deadline. I, I guess I'm struggling with that because that's something that they shouldn't have to be told. If we know, for example, I don't know what kind of a report it is. If it's a recurring monthly report, it's due on the fifth every month. It's due on the fifth every month. You don't. That's part of a. That's part of the agreement that they made when they took the job. Uh, one of. The, I don't know. I feel like I'm struggling with the, with, with that. Here, here's the thing I'm thinking about right now, which is it's about commitment. Sometimes I think people get this feeling, well, I'm not telling people what to do so people can commit at a micro level. I like this task, I don't like that task. That's not the case. When you, so if I put together a four person team, let's just, I put together a four person team and there's a, a red, blue, green, and yellow flavored person and you're the blue flavored person, and there are certain things you need to do to support the team. You're the, the decision you make is at the beginning, are you gonna join the team? Are you, do you wanna be part of this? Once you join the team, when the team's gotta make a, do a project or pick up a SEAL team or design a new product, and you, you're, you have the blue part, you're gonna do it. You don't get to choose at that point. That's a commitment you've already made. So, I mean, you can talk about the impact of not having the, the report. You can talk about the rest of the team that's relying on the report. I'd be more curious about why the report's not getting done. Yeah, it's, David, it, what, if, it, yeah, go if ahead. I could throw in here, um, this might help. Um, having worked for David quite a bit, um, if we were late with something, he would not... There was never, hey, chief, I need this report tonight. It was, hey, chief, is there anything I can do to help you? Can I help you with this? Because we had already made the commitment that that's what we were going to deliver on that time. And I also have found that in my teams as well, that that works. If if I got a guy that's consistently late with something, I'm looking at not how do I fix that person and make him deliver on time, but what is happening in his environment or her environment that's making it that their default is being late. And so one of the things that I really loved about working for David was it was always, hey, what can I do to help you? Well, you know, David, I could use this. And then he would help me get that. Or, you know what, David, I don't need any help on this. I've been procrastinating. I need to I need to put the procrastination piece aside. So that's in fact we spent God, what did we spent five days together last year where David helped me um with with a project that he's not he's he didn't it wasn't five days of him telling me what to do. It was five days of working together, collaborating and helping. Um that piece was awesome. Maybe that helps with the answering the question. Yeah, that's good. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I, it's nuanced because you also don't want to reward bad behavior. I mean, one way to get a bunch of attention is be late. So therefore, I jump in and say, I help you. So yeah, I might, 
the reason why I want to help, the, the question, how can I help? It's partly so I can help, but it's partly so I can understand what's really going on. And I say, well, I never can find this data because this other person not giving me the data or maybe I just stayed up all night playing video games. Okay, so that's a different problem. But, but you won't really understand that. Um, again, assume good intent, assume they're not trying uh, to screw it up. I, I think most all of us have 26 hours of work a day. So it's always an issue of prioritization. Also never say I never, I, I didn't have time. You, you always have time, just an issue of prioritization. All right, I, um, thanks you guys. And like I say, we're gonna keep doing these every week until we declare victory or something, I don't know. Go ahead and leave your comments. I appreciate everyone jumping in. I uh, also invite you to, to make comments on the, on, the nudge, on the YouTube channel and connect on LinkedIn, say hi. LinkedIn, Twitter, I mean, I'm on Instagram now, I'm learning about that. <laughs> yeah. Cheers, be well, stay safe, wear your mask when you go out. Thanks everybody, have a great day.